Several years ago, I was cruising along the coast of British Columbia, up in northern, on the west coast of Canada, and Marvin Robinson, a First Nation Gitgat guide, a wonderful man, came up to me, and out of the blue, just, you know, we got talking, and he found out I was a photographer, and he told me that Canada uh, Oil Sands wants to ship their bitumen, their oil, their dirty crude, through these narrow passageways. And he said, please help me. Can you do a story and help us keep these oil tankers out of there? So I tried to think, what could I do that would help bring attention to this area, this sensitive, fragile habitat. And I thought I could do a story on the Kermode bear, the spirit bear, the black bear that has the rare recessive gene that's pure white. And I thought if I could just get pictures of this really rare, hard to find, elusive white bear, then I can bring attention to this cause of trying to keep oil tankers out of this area. It's such a beautiful, pristine habitat. Now proposing that story was one of the dumber things I've ever done. It's this bear is more rare than the panda. It rains 24-7 in this area. It's not a nice place to work. But uh, off we went, and I told Marvin Robinson, the spirit bear git gat guide, that I was having a really hard time finding bears. There was a place where tourists go, they have a higher chance of seeing spirit bears. I didn't want to go there. I don't like the trees, I didn't like the habitat, I didn't want to be other around, around other people. I wanted to lose myself in the habitat with this wonderful bear. And so he said, I'll put you on this creek, I can't guarantee anything, but I know of a great big male spirit bear. And if you see him, he's wonderful, he's gentle, and he'll give you all your pictures. And so I sat there for a month along the edge of this river. And one day I'm walking back to the boat, sort of, you know, my head held down low and camera gear is all wet. I'm kind of, kind of bumming out and kind of miserable and thinking, you know, this, it's not going to end my career, but, you know, it really it would really suck to fail a coverage for National Geographic and just tell them I couldn't do it because I proposed it. And they always remind us here that, you know, they're a magazine, they publish pictures, not excuses. So I'm walking back to the sailboat, and all of a sudden I catch out of the corner of my eye, there's this big bear just sitting there in the forest beside me on the other side of the river. I take a couple pictures. He comes down to the river, and he grabs a big salmon. And before I know it, I find my, the, the, the intensity, I've been trying to get this moment now for three months, the intensity of, of, of just wanting to get this situation, I find myself three feet away from this bear. I'm shooting this scene on a 16 millimeter lens, wide angle, I've got off camera flash going pop, 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 motor drives cooking. He could hardly care that I was there. He just ate his fish and he was so casual, he would take his big uh, pink salmon, he would lay it up on a rock, take one, one nail, one claw, and he'd cut it open, suck the eggs out, let the fish go, and he would swim away with his belly cut open. And I had, you know, I ended up killing a lot of fish following this bear up the river because he was wounding all these fish. And it just made me sad for him, but they were, and they were gonna die eventually in the spawning process. And then I followed him into the forest. You know, I've always dreamed of being close to a bear in a forest. We've seen pictures of bears along rivers. And I followed him into the forest, and he's eating this fish, and all of a sudden he stands up and he walks right up to me. He's about a foot away from me, two feet from me, and he's just staring at me, and I'm crouching down, and I'm staring at him. And he looks so relaxed, and I realized that there was only one little entrance into this little cove and I was blocking his exit. So I stepped to the side like this and he walked back and went down to the river and got another fish. And this went on for two days. And I got to the point where I could start shooting art of this, you know, art, artistic, artful pictures of this bear. When I photograph, I use a formula. I say 20% of your time, just nail the picture, get something, get it sharp, get it in the middle, you know, get the exposure right, give my editor something to look at. And then once I get that, I jump into the next 60% where I try and push the photography artistic boundaries a little bit. You know, here I was doing these three second exposures and bears never stop moving their heads. So when I'm doing three second exposures, I've got all these sharp butts and all these blurry heads and all you can see is sort of a white ball. And so finally I got sick of this and I'm, I've taken about 500 pictures at this point and I wave my arm and I like this and he just goes, stops for a second, he stares at me and I go click. And that was the only one that was sharp. And then finally, to this, I call this Ewok. So I followed him. <laughs> I followed him up into the forest, and it was really sort of eerie. You're in this forest, and it's this shaved and paved forest. It's terrible. But way up in the hills, there was this one old growth cedar that the, that the loggers left behind, probably because it was culturally modified. If you look at this here, the, the First Nations probably, you know, hundreds of years ago, cut off the bark to make baskets. And that's why the First Nations think that that big, beautiful uh, red cedar was not taken down. And the bear chose that tree to go to sleep under. 
And as we were heading out, the sh we, we got this entire story out of three months. We got it in a day and a half, if you can imagine. And, and it was on the last week of the three months. And as we were heading out in the sailboat, we see a bear up on a hillside eating uh, crab apples. And it was so dark. I could hardly see, but I thought I'd grab a couple pictures. I wasn't that excited by them at the time after having this incredible experience on the river, but somehow it made the cover of National Geographic, which was pretty exciting. And it also was great because it gave my, my, my girlfriend, partner Christina Minnemeyer, who founded uh, International League of Conservation Photographers. And when she found out we were there working, she brought an entire team of, the, of some of the world's top photographers and she brought in NBC TV, TV, ABC, Tree Hugger, you know, bloggers and dot comers, and she brought in everybody to bring attention to this cause. And right now, we're currently still working with the First Nations, and we're we're doing well. We're fighting a good fight against the Canada oil sands and shipping their dirty oil through these waters. And we need your help on that issue as well. <laughs>